So welcome everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you're here uh, joining me for this presentation of uh, attracting birds, butterflies, bees, and other beneficials. So I'd like to thank the Hope of Hadley Grange, the Hadley Public Library, and the Hadley Cultural Council for co-sponsoring this event. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we, are, we live on land that was managed and inhabited before European colonization. Uh, please take a moment to find your location on the map and honor those whose land we now occupy. So what are beneficials? Uh, well, beneficial organisms, according to uh, farmers and gardeners, are those that help them grow the plants that they are growing uh, for our sustenance. And those include pollinators, uh, very important uh, role that they play. Without pollinators, uh, plants would not be able to transfer their pollen uh, from one flower of one plant to the uh, pist uh, pistil of a different plant. And uh, so it ensures genetic diversity, and, and which uh, is important for uh, uh, resilience in case uh, the plants need to change to adapt in response to changes in their environment. Uh, there are many kinds of pollinators. The most important ones are the bees, followed by butterflies, moths, wasps, hummingbirds, ant flies, and beetles. Uh, these pollinators have different color preferences. Bees love blue and purples. Butterflies love anything that's brightly colored. Hummingbirds similarly, and, and with a particular uh, appreciation for red. And 88%, or rather 80% of all plants need pollinators to set seed. The remainder, uh, remaining 20% uh, rely on wind pollination. And they make a difference to people who are growing food. Uh, you can see that strawberry on the left uh, was blessed with pollinators visiting the flower and it made a good uh, fruit. However, the one in the middle uh, did not receive any pollen from a different flower uh, and uh, didn't do too well and the well on the right only did marginally better uh, use uh, benefiting from wind pollinated. In other words, there was some strawberry pollen that drifted over, but not nearly as much as would have been delivered by a pollinator. One third of our food is pollinated. Uh, and there are also, uh, to, to add to the list of, uh, you know, not, not only pollinators, but predators and parasites that prey on garden pests. Here's a rogues gallery of some of the pests that uh, we like to manage, uh, if hopefully, using integrated pest management, IPM. You could also call it intelligent pest management. And there are a number of ways to do this. You could put floating row covers on your plants and create a barrier that way. Also, companion plants uh, uh, are a, a way to inhibit uh, uh, or deter uh, animals and pests that, that, that might be bothered by the smell of those plants. Hand picking is another approach. Just pick them off those plants, organic pesticides, and then finally predators. Uh, so here we have some vertebrate predators, hummingbirds, songbirds, uh, bats, uh, and then the invertebrates such as spiders and praying mantises, which are both generalists. And so they'll catch whatever they can. Uh, but these heroes, uh, surfeit fly, assassin bug, gall midge, firefly, ladybug, and pirate bug are all focusing on those aphids and other pests that we appreciate uh, uh, having uh, uh, minimizing and uh, as we're growing food. Uh, parasites also do that work. Uh, here's the trichogramma wasp in the upper left, a tiny little thing that can lay its own eggs in the eggs of, of other insect pests. And then the, the wasps that are also parasitic laying their eggs in either the larvae or the adults of the pest insects, which will result in, in their death and uh, controlling their numbers. But let's not think. Let's not forget about all, all the uh, the soil that's teeming with uh, microorganisms that are uh, not only beneficial but essential to the health of the plants. Uh, they are they are uh, recycling nutrients, uh, helping the, the plants to uh, to grow in, in their optimal health. Much better way to to uh, get your nutrients than from uh, inorganic uh, fertilizers. And there's a whole host of small uh, critters that uh, we perhaps don't think about that much, but and, and they, we may not think of them as being particularly beneficial. But 
Each one has its role to play in the ecosystem. For example, slugs we might think of as a pest, but uh, they would prefer to dine on decaying vegetation. And so, and by doing so, they would be helping to uh, recycle the vegetation, which is their job in the ecosystem. And they'll probably ignore your plants because they have their favorite food. Well, we're dealing right now with something called an apocalypse, insect apocalypse. This is, ha has been uh, confirmed all over the world that insect numbers have declined dramatically, uh, sometimes 75% or even mo more uh, in total insect numbers have been lost uh, in, uh, in the last, say, half century or so. Uh, a world without insects is not a world that we want to or can live in. A flowerless world with silent forests, a world of dung and old leaves and rotting carcasses accumulating in cities and roadsides, a world of collapse or decay and erosion and loss that would spread through ecosystems, spiraling from predators to plants. Declining biodiversity is also a problem with vertebrate animals. All of them uh, uh, have a significant number of species that are endangered and biodiversity is so important because uh, there is great, uh, uh, there, there are significant numbers of uh, vertebrates whose names we may not even be familiar with and we wouldn't be able to identify them, but we have no idea what role they're playing, but uh, they're, they, are, they are all important, some more important than others, but um, uh, there's, there's something else that uh, we can think of in terms of the benefits of nature, and that is for our own well-being. Uh, when, when we are stressed, uh, when we're dealing with anxiety, depression, uh, in Japan, they call it forest bathing. They say it's important to get out there in nature. There are several forests that are uh, uh, certified as being good for Shinrin Yoku, forest bathing. And we can certainly, uh, I think many people in this time of uh, the pandemic have been prescribing that for themselves. Just get out there in nature, out in your own, uh, on your own property or, or on a trail someplace. and uh, remember that we're all part of nature. Benefits of birds include pest control, seed dispersal, and carrion cleanup. The crows and the turkey vultures uh, help uh, clean up those uh, carcasses they find. And uh, birds inspire us as well. You, you can see from these paintings by J.F. Lansdowne and think about all the uh, poetry and uh, writings and music. Uh, birds and all other nature uh, forms of nature are so inspiring to us. Bird populations have declined by 30% since 1970. That's two thirds of our birds could be gone by 2100. So this is certainly uh, not sustainable. Rachel Carson in 1962 wrote the book, Silent Spring, warning about the effects of pesticides uh, on our environment and on birds in particular. And agricultural pesticides remain a, a significant uh, issue. Don't use neonicotinoids in, in particular. They, are, they should be banned from our environment. They are systemic and they, uh, as small a dose as two seeds of a plant that's been treated with nic nicotinoids, neonicotinoids, uh, will make migrating birds anorexic. They sim simply won't have the appetite to eat and that affects them uh, and potentially in a fatal way. Um, window collisions kill uh, many birds every year. Birds see the windows and the reflections and they think that must be a continuation of the out of doors, which it certainly isn't. So uh, there are a number of ways to make uh, your windows more visible. You can visit abcbirds.org. Uh, I'd be happy to send a list of resources, by the way, which include all of these links you'll see at the bottom of these slides. So you won't have to uh, uh, make notes about them. Cats kill many birds every year and it's good to keep your bird indoors. In fact, there are many uh, wild animals that might make a meal of your cat if, uh, uh, if it's uh, out of luck and, uh, or even other cats and dogs that are, on, that are on the loose can be hazardous. Habitat loss, agriculture and development has a profound impact on bird populations as does climate change, creating drought, wildfires, flooding and seasonal changes um, that uh, are upsetting populations. Birds need food, water, shelter, and places to rear their young, just like all other forms of wildlife. But don't feed them with uh, processed baked goods because they contain preservatives, salt, sugar, and refined flour. Um, and 
they don't have enough protein and fat, which birds need. So this is the result of a bird that, when birds eat too much of this overly processed food, uh, their wings become useless. Approved foods for songbirds include apples, bananas, cooked pasta and rice, eggshells, hard cheese, peas, corn, oats, chopped lettuce, melon, pumpkin and squash seeds, peanut butter, raisins and nuts, and of course, bird seed. It's fun to sometimes to experiment with different kinds of food to see what birds are attracted to which foods. And you can make your own homemade bird feeder and there are many different ways to do it. You can just do a search online for that topic. Uh, if you have an open bird feeder like this, you will need to clean it frequently because um, it, they will, of course, soil uh, that, that bird feeder. Um, the best bird seed to feed is a pure sunflower seed in most cases. Um, squirrel baffles are a good idea. Our window feeder also might be inaccessible to squirrels and it's a good way to see the birds up close and also monitor your feeder closely to see if it needs cleaning. Here's a homemade suet recipe and you really only need uh, two ingredients, the suet and the ground cornmeal. Uh, but if you decide to include the peanut butter, you melt that with the suet uh, and stir it up and, and, uh, and heat it until it's uh, all uh, well mixed. And then you add in the dry ingredients and pour the uh, and dried ingredients into uh, ice cube trays or another form that will uh, fit inside those uh, suet feeders, freeze it for a couple of hours, and then it's good to go. Uh, suet does become rancid at temperatures above 50 degrees. You can uh, offer water for drinking for birds that's different from a bird bath. On the left-hand side of the slide is a homemade water feeder, and the one on the right is uh, offered for sale. Bird baths don't need to be expensive. You can improvise. Uh, heated bird baths are much appreciated by birds in the middle of winter. It's difficult sometimes to find water that has melted. Uh, bird boxes uh, can be found at all-birds.com for these eight birds and others as well. Uh, if you'd like to make your own, they have different dimensions. For example, the box floor and box height are specified for each bird. Also the entrance height and the entrance diameter and the placement height above the, the distance above the ground. They all have their different dimensions. Uh, you do not want to welcome starlings or house sparrows. These are both non-native uh, invasive birds that have uh, increased their numbers significantly and uh, have harmed populations of native birds. So they are not protected. You, you are allowed to harass and trap these birds and do with them what you please. This is a wonderful uh, model for a bluebird box. It's called a Peterson bluebird box. You'll see that there is a metal baffle on top, which will uh, give this bird box a lifetime guarantee. Most boxes will, uh, will just decay and rot within a few years, and that's, that's it. But this one, uh, will, because you keep it dry, uh, it, it, it'll just last forever. Uh, and it, it should have uh, one, at, one, at least one side should be easily uh, opened to clean and inspect. Uh, you should clean bird boxes at the end of the year. Uh, don't use bright colors because that attracts the bird box to predators. Also, don't provide a perch because birds don't need it. They can fly right to that window, uh, but it'll give the, the predators purchase to on using that perch to you know, uh, hoist themselves up to the hole. Uh, there are two don'ts in this picture. It should not be made of ceramic. It should be completely wood uh, and it should not be hanging uh, loosely in the breeze like that. You might want to protect your birdhouse from squirrels because they will uh, enlarge that hole with their strong teeth uh, unless you prevent them from doing so. Uh, here are some uh, ways to, to uh, protect your birds uh, from other predators and not only squirrels, but raccoons, snakes, cats, and birds. At the end of the summer, clean your birdhouse with a solution of water and bleach, nine to one. Leave birdhouses in place over the winter for shelter for the birds. You might even want to make a winter roosting box or purchase one. Adults eat animal protein, insects, and other vertebrates, whatever they can find. 
They eat fruit, they eat seeds, and a number of other plant parts, including flower buds, flowers, leaf buds, new leaves, grass shoots, on the, the list goes, and certainly nuts and sap. Now, uh, bringing nature home, uh, Doug Talamese is the author. He's a, a PhD who has uh, thoroughly studied how important native plants are for feeding birds. You'll see here a black cap chickadee delivering those nice soft caterpillars to uh, her chicks. Uh, this is the ideal baby food for birds. It's nice and it's soft and it's uh, just packed with nutrients, just what the, the chicks need. But in order to find those caterpillars, uh, that bird will have to be near native trees. The reason that non-native trees and shrubs are uh, not good places to find caterpillars is that they have uh, defenses that that the caterpillars have not figured out how to crack yet in, in terms of evolutionary time. Uh, the countries that those plants came from uh, probably do have uh, caterpillars munching on the leaves, but not here. So uh, our own native trees and shrubs are the ones that will nourish the caterpillars that will in turn feed the chicks. The best trees, vines, and shrubs to plant for birds. Here's a starter list uh, from allaboutbirds.org, which is the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology. And there we have this beautiful native tree called an oak. And there's so many caterpillars that will visit uh, these leaves that uh, birds will have a feast there. Mulberry fruits are very popular with birds. I love them as well, so I can understand why. Uh, it's, a, it's a fairly messy tree. You wouldn't want to plant it over your sidewalk or your driveway, but if you have a corner of your property uh, to plant it, the birds will appreciate it. And there are a number of other plants that have fruits that are edible for a number of a quantity of birds. And elderberry is a shrub uh, with fruit that uh, is edible for both humans and, and uh, birds. I, I love them in my uh, pancakes. Uh, it's also great for pollinators. Any viburnum. And these viburnums are so attractive. So most of us want ornamentals. There's no reason why we can't have native ornamentals. Red osier dogwood, beautiful every season of the year. And all the, all the dogwoods are appealing, have fruit that's uh, tasty to birds. You can get 10 of these white dogwood trees from arborday.org and they have a number of other selections as well. You just have to make a donation, but the donation can be as, small as you choose to make it. They'll be small trees for sure, but uh, you can't beat the price. Spice bush has fruit that's 50% fat, which is a good thing for birds. It gives them energy. Staghorn sumac has berries that last, fruit that lasts into the winter. Blueberries are quite popular with birds, as are winter berry holly fruits in the winter. Um, such a incredibly ornamental tree all seasons of the year. You do need a, a male plants to pollinate the females so that you'll get those fruits, which is also true of this holly. Juneberry is an absolutely gorgeous small tree and those fruits are delicious, just as good tasting as blueberries for both humans and birds. And there's hawthorn fruits, another native tree and crab apples, black cherries, aronia, a black choke berry, not choke cherry. People often uh, grow this plant thinking of it as an ornamental and aren't even aware how those fruits are delicious for both birds and humans. MissouriBotanicalGarden.org is a great resource incidentally to find in valuable information about plants. If you look up aronia and Missouri, uh, that's all you need and you'd come up with uh, all this practical information and more besides. Uh, it, it might tell you uh, whether um, uh, whether deer are browsing on the plant, for example, and, and there'll be a couple of paragraphs of information in addition to what you see here. Red chokeberry is another aronia. The birds will visit for fruit. Blackberry, black raspberry, northern bayberry late into the winter. Those fruits are a welcome sight for hungry birds. And all the conifers provide shelter for nesting birds, uh, shelter from the, from the storm in the winter. 
Uh, also a number of insects and uh, caterpillars will be visiting the tree and the birds can help themselves to that abundance. Once you've selected the trees or shrubs that you want to plant, you need to dig your hole twice as wide as you might think necessary, but no deeper than absolutely necessary. You don't want the plant to sink so that the stem is below uh, the surface. Keep the topsoil and subsoil in separate piles when you're digging that hole so that you can return uh, first the subsoil and then the topsoil once you've laid that plant in the ground. You want to have uh, ample uh, mulch but not too close to the stem or the trunk. And you can create a rim so that it'll hold water like a bowl when it rains or when you water it. You will want to irrigate your plants at least the first year, maybe, maybe two. Vines are also uh, options for birds to find food. The, incidentally, the fruit of the Virginia creeper is not edible for humans, but it is for birds. Uh, we can both eat riverbank grape and fox grape fruits. Here's a list of birds that feed on wild grape. And you can find lists like this uh, of all the wildflower, uh, all the wildlife that would be uh, feeding on uh, any plant that you're curious about at illinoiswildflowers.info. Here's another vine with fruits that mockingbirds and catbirds eat, and they'll also make their nests in that vine. And a wonderful uh, ground cover that's evergreen and has edible fruits for not just bears, but birds as well. And what bird wouldn't want? Sunflower seeds uh, readily available. Uh, Black-eyed Susan is a closely related plant in the aster family that also has, has edible seeds, as does purple coneflower. And more seeds for birds. Every one of the plants on this list uh, is another member of the aster family, with the exception of sedum down at the bottom. So leave your seed stalks st standing in the winter so that birds can eat those seeds. Leaving plants standing also gives insects much needed habitat. For the same reason, you would want to leave the leaves wherever you can. Maybe you can rake some underneath the shrubs or use it as a mulch around trees. Leave dead trees and snags for birds to nest in and, and to create uh, a place for insects uh, to live and also create brush piles for a wide variety of wildlife. So too much of our habit, uh, too much of our landscape looks like this, well manicured, but nothing there for birds or other wildlife, except in this illustration, perhaps the tree is a native tree. But uh, lawns are a status symbol back from the you know, centuries ago, just to, to prove that uh, the Lord of the Manor didn't have to use his land for agricultural purposes. And we still are living with that status symbol and the costs of it in terms of our environment. This is a food, not only a food desert for wildlife, but a polluter and a resource guzzler. So many, uh, so much in, in the way of pesticides, uh, water use. So it's a good goal to reduce lawns by 25%, uh, not only to have less lawn, but to have more wildlife habitat and to create a sanctuary in your, on your property. So this is a request that uh, many environmental organizations are making, which seems reasonable. Now, when we do uh, move towards natural landscaping and as our properties start to look like the left, left hand side of the street instead of the right, uh, there might be some pushback or some skepticism about whether it would be a good idea. So uh, here are some myths and facts about that uh, uh, regarding this issue. Uh, myth, meadows and natural landscapes are not fire hazards. It takes uh, sustained high heat for them to be such a problem. Uh, Attracting vermin, likewise, is not an issue. Natural landscape does not sustain rats. And Lyme disease ticks is a legitimate concern, but you can establish setbacks or paths for walking. And if you want to learn more about Lyme disease, uh, Lyme disease and how to prevent limes, uh, how to prevent ticks from uh, uh, you know, reaching you or, or people who are at your, you know, on your property, uh, you can visit LymeDisease.org 
Uh, you can use a repellent with 20 to 30% of any of these products. There's something called permethrin, which you can treat your clothing and gear with that actually kills the ticks and a number of other uh, pesky insects. Uh, and it, it'll last for 70 washings if you used factory treated clothing. Now mosquitoes uh, uh, are not a problem if, if you, because you will not have long standing puddles in, in your natural landscape. But if you do choose to have a water feature and that is a, an invitation to a lot of valuable wildlife, uh, there are ways to control those mosquito larvae, which you see in the upper left hand corner there. Uh, koi and goldfish, also mosquito fish are a natural way of com controlling them. You can also use BTI, which is a bacterium and is and so in for that reason is organic. They're called mosquito dunks or mosquito bits. And finally, if you keep the water in motion with a solar activated pump, that'll do the job because uh, mosquito larvae can only breed in stagnant water. Allergenic pollen is a concern of some people as well, uh, but non-native plants and grasses are the ones that, that cause the problem of allergies, uh, not, uh, not the uh, native wildflowers. Ragweed, for example, is uh, public enemy number one in terms of allergies, Ambrosia artemisifolia. Here's three more plants that have been implicated. And then there are allergenic grasses that I mentioned. How about property values? Would it make your property messy and unattractive to go natural? Well, the natural landscaping can in fact enhance property values if it's done well. A single tree uh, raises the value of your property by thousands of dollars if it's a, a as it grows and matures and if it's a well-placed and you know a special tree. Uh, migrating birds prefer native fruits. There was a study done in Plymouth recently uh, where uh, they would actually selectively prefer blueberries, black cherries, and black raspberries, all native fruits, uh, and would avoid Japanese barberry, oriental bittersweet, and multiflora rose, all of which are invasive. Even when there's plenty of them, uh, they, they just preferred the uh, native fruits because they're more nutritious. There are other reasons to avoid native plants, such as Japanese knotweed, and that is because they take over your landscape uh, mercilessly. So you have to be merciless with them in, in eradicating them. Uh, Japanese knotweed is a particularly difficult one to, to control because uh, it uh, has a very strong root system and it's almost impossible to dig out that root system. So uh, uh, a stand of Japanese knotweed, if you have the ability to actually cut the plants down to the base, uh, every couple of weeks for about three to four years throughout the gro growing season, that would do it. Uh, smothering is also a possibility. Uh, and then you, uh, if you can keep that uh, smothering layer in place and it would have to go several yards beyond the stand of Japanese knotweed in order to prevent those plants from escaping uh, uh, and uh, going, going around the barrier. Uh, Oriental bittersweet is a vine that can choke uh, and kill trees, as you see in the lower picture. Uh, very pervasive. So you just really need to dig it out and, and uh, control it uh, carefully. Autumn olive is a shrub that was actually established here because uh, it can, um, it, it's, it's beneficial to uh, deal with easily, uh, deal with a property that's where there's erosion. Uh, so it's erosion control in part because it, it's able to fix its own atmospheric nitrogen. Uh, but uh, in the process, they, it does its job too well and it has an advantage over the uh, wild or the native plants. Multiflora rose is another uh, plant that was brought over here intentionally and it turned out to be a mistake because it's, it's just taken over so many, so much of our native, um, you know, displaced so many of our native plants. So there are a number of other plants uh, that, uh, garlic mustard being one, that uh, it's good to learn them. Uh, go to masslive.com. You'll see a list of invasive plants in Massachusetts. You might want to uh, have someone who's knowledgeable about botany uh, survey your property and uh, inform you about what you have and what needs to be controlled. Poison ivy is actually not an invasive plant. It's a native plant, and it has its place in the woods where birds will uh, actually uh, eat the, the fruits. 
Um, but if you want to control the population of poison ivy on your property, you certainly have a right to do that. And one way to do that might be cutting everything at ground level and then smothering it. That's uh, sheet mulching uh, is a way to, to, uh, to begin uh, to, to transform your property to uh, something that you want to grow from a lawn or a patch of weeds or virtually anything, as, as long as you cut everything very close to the ground and, and cover it with cardboard, overlapping cardboard, or six thicknesses of newspaper would do it. Uh, the, the roll of cardboard is called ramboard, and you can uh, purchase that online if you want to uh, do a large area. And then the mulch is the layer on top. You might want to put some compost in there as well if, you, if you're starting a vegetable garden. But for wildflower gardens, it's really best not to over fertilize because the, your, uh, your plants, your native plants, uh, know how to handle uh, minimal uh, fertility and then will have an, an edge over weeds, which really depend on having a, a more fertile soil. Benefits of mulch include suppressing weeds, keeping the soil moist and cool, and enriching the soil. And you can use for annual beds, grass clippings, straw, shredded leaves, and pine needles or pine straw, which is not problematic. Uh, some people think that uh, there's, there's kind of a, a myth that dies hard that pine needles will actually make the soil acidic, which is not true. Uh, perennial beds, can uh, you can use shredded leaves and pine straw for them as well, but pine bark, sawdust, wood chips, and chip branch wood are additional options. This is what chip branch wood is, and it's a great uh, source of nutrition using, uh, containing both carbon and nitrogen. Uh, avoid dyed mulch because usually the pallets and that kind of wood that they use to make the, the dyed mulch uh, have uh, creosote and CCA, which are harmful to plants and other wildlife. And the volcano mulch that you see uh, upper left, uh, Landscapers should never do this. Uh, and uh, because that, as that mulch decomposes, you see the exposed roots on the right that re result. Uh, a properly mulched tree is shown at the bottom. Uh, don't forget that weeds can still grow in mulch uh, and try to make it temporary. Try to plan that uh, how your, uh, your plantings are gonna command that space and there won't be any need for mulch because there won't be any opportunities for seeds to come in and, and colonize. Ground covers serve as a living mulch. They do the same things that mulch do. They mulches do, preventing weeds, retaining moisture, keeping the soil cool, and holding the soil in place on slopes. Uh, uh, bearberry is an example of a wonderful ground cover that you can establish in the full sun, and the birds love it. Thyme, three-leaved sink foil, golden star, Wild ginger in the shade, another shade plant, Bishop's hat. This is a native Pachysandra. Barren strawberry and even wild strawberry can be a ground cover. We only have one hummingbird here in Massachusetts that you can reliably see, and that's the ruby-throated hummingbird. And they are, they don't really need our protection now. They're, they're, their numbers have doubled in the last half a century. But uh, if you want to welcome them, you can provide moving water, provide snags for perches, leave dead trees, because as the uh, yellow-bellied sapsucker or pileated woodpecker makes its holes, that hummingbird's going to find the holes and find the insects that are attracted to the sap. Uh, webs are useful to hummingbirds not only because they can help themselves to the insect or the spider in the web itself, but the uh, the silk, the spider silk, is an essential part of their web, uh, their nest construction. Here is a hummingbird nest, and because they use the spider silk, that nest will expand to double its size as the chicks grow. Don't disturb the nests because if you call it, you you might be calling attention uh, to predators uh, that there is a nest there if you if you're visiting and and being curious about something like a hummingbird nest and certainly don't move it. it. But it is okay to rescue a hummingbird chick or any other chick that falls out of the nest. It's not true that uh, the mother bird would reject the chick just because you've touched it. And if you want to feed them, uh, this is a good feeder to use because you can uh, easily clean it. Uh, just uh, unscrews and you, un you clean both halves. 
um, here's the recipe. Uh, you don't need to buy nectar. You just make uh, one cup water and one quarter cup sugar uh, in that ratio. You uh, heat to dissolve, refrigerate, and use it within one week. Uh, you also need to replace the food in the feeder every few days and clean it every three days uh, with hot tap water, scrubbing the sides, but don't use soap. And if you have black mold, soak it in a solution of one quarter cup bleach to one gallon of water for an hour. If the nectar becomes cloudy and is spoiled, it needs to be replaced. So, uh, and that can happen in just one day. So you might want to think about um, how flowers do the job so much better. Don't forget that hummingbirds are also great uh, predators uh, and, and they're, uh, they can hunt for insects on the fly. They can find them where they, uh, wherever they might be. Uh, and so they need a lot of energy to go hunting for those insects and they get it from flowers. And they have just the right balance of sucrose, glucose and fructose from that uh, nectar plus the essential uh, tr trace elements of um, minerals and proteins and amino acids that are found in that nectar. Trumpet creeper is a vine that's irresistible to hummingbirds. It's quite robust, robust as a vine and you don't, wouldn't want to plant it near your foundation. Here's another appealing vine for a hummingbird, trumpet honeysuckle, cardinal flower. Hummingbirds love that color red. And is, this, this is a sensational flower. Wild columbine offers them nourishment when they've just arrived from uh, their migration in the spring. Either color of turtle head, butterfly weed, anise hyssop, obedient plant, Blazing Star, Swamp Milkweed, Foxglove Beard Tongue in the Spring, Purple Coneflower, and Phlox. Any of the Phlox species are all uh, appealing to hummingbirds. So they're drawn to the color red, but then they'll check out what else there is in the garden. And if they like it, they'll have some more. Bats are also effective predators. And uh, Little Brown Bat uh, is. Uh, uh, the numbers have plummeted. Uh, not, we've lost 90% of them uh, due to uh, white nose syndrome, which is a, a bacterial uh, or rather a fungal infection. So we can install bat houses and you can go to mass.gov to find um, information about how to build one or you can purchase one online. We're only allowed to evict bats in the spring and fall. Uh, Otherwise, they might be rearing their pups. Leave dead trees standing for bats. Don't use pesticides. Keep cats indoors because a cat can decimate a roost if it finds it. Minimize artificial lighting because it distracts and disturbs them. Butterflies and moths are charismatic. Well, the butterflies are the most charismatic uh, of insects. Uh, moths less so, usually they're drab. Uh, they're much more numerous than butterflies, by the way. There are about 20 times as many moths as there are butterflies out there, but we just don't see them as much because they're more nocturnal, uh, usually. But the, the, the main anatomical difference is that uh, moths have antennae that look like feathers and butterflies have antennae that, look, uh, that are more simple and have, are club-tipped. Also, butterflies make chrysalises and moths spin cocoons. Butterflies and moths are in trouble, 30% population reduction over the past 20 years, uh, resulting from habitat loss, pesticides, and climate change, most likely. Um, here's, here are some host plants for the polythemus moth. So a number of trees will nourish that caterpillar. The large winged moths such as this one are, have particularly de declined in numbers. Here's a list of trees that would sustain luna moth caterpillars. And host plants for the eight spotted forester moth include wild grape and Virginia creeper. Cecropia moth host plants, another list of trees. So that, uh, and the, the willow is in particular is one of my favorites. Butterfly gardening uh, is, uh, is possible when you have a lot, of, especially desirable to have a lot of sun, at least six hours a day. Uh, it's good to have a water source to keep those plants watered when they need it. Shelter from the wind is a good idea. Host plants are essential. You need to be able to provide those plants that the, butter, that the butterflies can um, 
uh, lay their eggs on, knowing that uh, the larvae will find a meal there. And nectar producing plants throughout the growing season. Organic landscaping practices are very important so that the insects can stay healthy. But butterfly boxes uh, don't do butterflies any good. There's never, they've, uh, they've never been found to, to actually uh, contain butterflies. Uh, spiders, yes, wasps, yes, but butterflies never use them. But mud, that's a different story. Uh, the males need mud because uh, they, need, they use the minerals in the mud to create the pheromones that attract the females. They also give some of those minerals to the female when they mate so that uh, that nourishes the eggs as they're developing. So we can give butterflies mud in a bird bath or in a saucer, a flower pot saucer, that's, and if it's embedded in the ground, it'll stay uh, moist longer. And you can use gravel or sand, preferably sand from the beach because it has those salts that butterflies need, but you can add salt or compost to it uh, and keep it moist. Give them fruit, and if it's rotting, so much the better as far as the butterfly is concerned. Give them host plants. So the best host plants, according to nwf.org, National Wildlife Federation, goldenrod is the champion. It feeds 125 different species of moth and butterfly larvae. Strawberries in second place at 81, sunflower at 58, bird's foot trefoil 32, and then here's a list of other plants that are significant in terms of being host plants from butterflies and moss. But trees are far better. <laughs> Oak, for example, which was mentioned earlier for uh, the, the first most popular tree for, for birds for this reason, 473 different species coming in at the champion number one position. 399 species uh, are hosted by willow leaves, birch leaves, 393, and then several other trees and shrubs that are also very valuable as food for caterpillars. An example then of uh, particular needs, and here's where you, you appreciate the need for diversity of many different kinds of plants in our landscapes. Spicebush and sassafras are the only two plants that will sustain spicebush swallowtail larvae with those wonderful fake eyes on, on the caterpillars. Uh, black swallowtail caterpillars can feed on any plant in the parsley family. Baltimore checker spot caterpillars look for turtle head or plantain leaves, depending on which brood, when in the season those plants are available. Spring azure caterpillars, New Jersey tea, dogwoods, viburnums, and meadow sweets are the host plants. Great spangled fritillary host plant is the violet, common blue violet as it's called. And now the most well-known, most charismatic butterfly uh, and the one that uh, certainly the most uh, research has been done about, the monarch butterfly. It requires some species of milkweed. Now here's the common milkweed, which is uh, found in the wild, but I do not recommend that you plant it in your garden because it, it's, pretty, uh, it, it's pretty aggressive. It's like a bully that'll take over uh, and make itself welcome much more than you would want it to. Uh, so in place of common milkweed, I suggest swamp milkweed, butterfly weed, and poke milkweed. And all of these milkweeds attract pollinators, uh, the adult pollinators uh, of the, the adult monarchs and, and a host of other butterflies and bees. That's a, a butterfly moth you, that you see upper, uh, upper row center. Pollinators of buff, butterfly weed include these butterflies. Swamp milkweed, butterflies and bees galore, and poke milkweed. The Biota of North America program is a resource where you can find which plants are in fact native to your region. Monarchs overwintering in Mexico have declined dramatically and 
number one reason is that they can't find enough milkweed. The, the glyphosate is, is killing the milkweed in, on uh, farmer's land uh, uh, when they're using herbicide resistant crops. Pesticide use, climate change, logging and development are also factors. So if you want to create a monarch way station and you can order a sign to demonstrate that you're doing it, which is always a good idea. Uh, here's an example uh, provided by edibleterrace.com, how to design a butterfly garden. Notice how there are different, uh, there are clumps of species rather than having them all scattered through throughout that garden bed. Uh, and that's advantageous for the butterflies when they're uh, focusing on one, on one uh, particular species, they don't have to travel far to find another one of that species. Uh, I, and again, I'd be happy to send you this link uh, if you'd like to know what the, uh, what the plants are in this garden. The top 15 butterfly plants, according to the North American Butterfly Association, uh, Sharon Stichter made up this list about a decade ago. Uh, and she included butterfly bush, but I think that uh, if, if you asked her now, she might change her mind because uh, the problem with butterfly bush, it's currently invasive in these states and you see that Massachusetts is one of them. It's uh, becoming more so perhaps. Uh, so we really should focus on, uh, on the natives and New Jersey tea is one of them. Sweet pepper bush, another shrub. Compass plant, a very tall plant that uh, you, you can, it's also called the cuff plant. You see how the leaves can hold water after a rain, uh, which is like a little reservoir of water for butterflies, bees, and birds to drink. Blazing star, just a beautiful plant that's, a, that's native to this region. Thistle, asters, a ver variety of species of aster. Purple coneflower, scabiosa, especially the more brightly colored ones. Uh, Joe pieweed, boneset. The milkweeds again and some annuals, including zinnia, Mexican sunflower, and marigolds. If you don't have a lot of land, you might wanna consider container gardening. Just a few plants might make a little bit of a difference to some insects out there. You might also think about the uh, stretch of land right in between the sidewalk and the road, which is called a health strip, and it could become habitat uh, you might want to check to see if, uh, if compaction is a problem and think about addressing that if, if it is an issue, but there's no reason why you couldn't end up with a beautiful garden like this, uh, attracting the admiration of passers-by, as well as the pollinators, of course. You could have uh, raised beds as, as an approach to creating habitat for butterflies or a, or a more traditional garden. And you could also think of your lawn as being potentially a habitat for butterflies and bees. Uh, any, any time you have flowers in a lawn that are blooming, uh, they're, they're not necessarily all native, but they are visited nonetheless by these uh, pollinators. And you can also call it a bee and butterfly lawn, a lazy lawnmower lawn and a freedom lawn because the, the whole idea here is just not to mow so often. If you mow every other week, no more often than that, You'll, give, you'll be giving these plants a chance to bloom. And of course you need to not use herbicides which are gonna kill the, uh, the broadleaf plants. Uh, the whole idea of uh, landscaping naturally is to relax a little bit and uh, welcome nature. Wildfire meadows are sensational visually and uh, ecologically. And uh, visit extension .unh.edu for more information. Uh, it's something that's going to uh, be a project that, uh, three to four years until it's really established. Uh, it takes a, a full year to eliminate vegetation on a site uh, to, in preparation for seeding in the fall. So uh, I do recommend, uh, you can certainly read the article, but uh, you might wanna consider uh, engaging the help of a, lands a professional landscaper uh, to give you guidance and, and uh, at least in, in part of that process. 
No, bees are the best pollinators out there because they have hairy bodies. Here's a that where native can uh, where pollen can uh, can coat uh, their bodies. Honeybee is the one that most people are f most familiar with, uh, but there are also uh, up to about 400 native bees out there in our state. A variety of sizes and shapes. Bees and wasps are different. Uh, someone might think that they've been stung by a bee, but it's more likely a yellow jacket that lurks in uh, ground nests. And it's a social animal that they have a high incentive to protect their hives. Uh, but uh, bees use are not a problem in terms of stinging, unless you really give them a hard time. So you can see how to tell bees from wasps. Bees are fuzzy. Wasps have little to no hair. Wasps also usually dangle their legs when flying, which bees don't. Well, the honeybee is a, a, definitely very important to us uh, economically. It, it pollinates a lot of crops and uh, it's, you can think of honeybees as livestock, uh, whether they're kept for the honey or as pollinators, uh, their more important economical role these days is as pollinators. Um, but they're not as good pollinators as a lot of native bees are. Uh, they, uh, they don't tend to uh, move from, you know, once they find a tree, for example, they're just going to stay in that one tree going from flower to flower. And uh, that doesn't do that tree a, lot of, a whole lot of good because it doesn't want to get pollinated by flowers uh, um, that are growing on the same tree. Also, honeybees are not particularly active in the cool weather. They, they want it to warm up. So native bees are, are uh, able to get out there and get the job done in the, in the cool spring weather. This is what a feral honeybee hive looks like, but you're not likely to find too many of them. There's much fewer now than there used to be. Uh, mostly due, I think, to the varroa mites that you see uh, that parasite on the, uh, on the back of that bee there. Uh, diseases and weather disasters have also affected the uh, honeybee colony populations. Uh, this gray bar here is acceptable winter loss, and you see it's been consistently above that in recent years. Neonics are part of the problem, uh, and it's it's quite a sinister uh, neonicotinoid, so it's the full name. Uh, this chemical is systemic. It harms all insects, and bees are actually drawn to it. Uh, they, they, they become uh, almost like addicted to it and uh, it, it disorients them and it, and it causes major die-offs, even small amounts. Uh, these days, we should be asking, are, do the whole, do the, do the um, supermarkets where we purchase our food uh, make good choices in terms of what, uh, 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 what uh, uh, sources of vegetables and fruits they're using um, and whether those sources are using those pesticides or not. You, uh, Whole Foods and Costco are the only ones uh, found to even make a grade C uh, in terms of their responsibility in this regard. So perhaps we can be motivated to either grow our own food or patronize the organic growers of food in places like farmers markets. So here we have a, a honeybee colony, a very different, uh, uh, there, there's no native bee at all like this. Uh, and we don't have any native bees that make honey. The bumblebee also is a colony, uh, um, a, a, uh, the, the queen forms a colony, but far fewer bees in number, they're just hundreds instead of thousands. Uh, and uh, they're, uh, very valuable bee. Uh, this, this is what a bumblebee hive looks like, but the, the queen has to start that hive all by herself uh, in the beginning of the spring. So she has to feed herself and feed those eggs um, with her foraging, uh, you know, her visits to the flowers in the spring. So it's so important for us to provide those, uh, those uh, floral resources uh, early in the spring. And these corbiculae, just like honeybees have them on their hind legs, they actually uh, pack the, the pollen in tight with the uh, nectar to wet it down and make it the consistency of red dough so they can carry a lot of pollen at once. Bumblebees are able to 
uh, vibrate the, the stamens of tomatoes and other members of the tomato family, such as uh, eggplant and peppers and uh, potatoes. Uh, other bees, honeybees can't do it, and most other bees cannot, but bumblebees can. They vibrate those stamens so that the, the pollen comes out the pores at the end and coats their bodies, and they're able to effectively uh, pollinate the, the tomatoes that way and significantly increase the yield. So uh, these, uh, this is a box of uh, accommodating the butterfly uh, colony, or excuse me, the bumblebee colony uh, that the growers encourage. Here are a number of other crops that are pollinated by bumblebees, raspberries, cranberries, blueberries, strawberries, and cucumbers. And some native plants that only bumblebees can avail themselves of, turtle head and bottle gentian, because no other bee is strong enough to get in there. And they have ample rewards of nectar in those flowers, which really gives the incentive to the bumblebee to visit them. So it's just, uh, it's really interesting to learn about the different details of the flowers and how they uh, attract different kinds of insects and, and, and try to get them to be um, faithful to them in, in some way. Now, here are a couple of bumblebees that uh, uh, are actually much more common than they used to be. You'll see these uh, gray lines here, which indicate from 2004 to 2006, they were far more common than previously. Uh, the two-spotted bumblebee and the common Eastern bumblebee are the ones that we're likely to find uh, out in uh, our yards, uh, but we are not going to see the rusty patch bumblebee here. Uh, it, it's gone from this area. A it used to be common, uh, and the American bumblebee likewise is now threatened. It also used to be common. So, uh, and it's believed that the reason for decline of so many bumblebee species is that uh, Europeans took some of our American bumblebee species and raised them and then sold them back to us, but in the process, they became uh, infected with uh, diseases that are now affecting our own native bumblebees. Um, so to encourage uh, bumblebees, leave, uh, leave mouse and bird nests. This is, this is where they like to start their colonies uh, and practice leave it be landscaping, natural landscaping, just as we found our, is, is valuable for birds. It's valuable for bumblebees as well. Uh, there's that, uh, an old mouse hole that this bumblebee on the left is visiting and using for its uh, hive, and then an, an old abandoned birdhouse another bumblebee is using. And you can make nesting boxes for them. I would invite you to check out Robert Jagir's Bee Ecology Citizen Science app. Uh, you, if you take pictures of bumblebees visiting different kinds of flowers and send them to him, he can use that information to understand better uh, which bumblebees are out there and which flowers they are visiting. And he'll help you with the identification. Here's a chart which des describes uh, comparing the bumblebees and how much black they have on their abdomen. There are bees out there, by the way, that look like bumblebees but aren't. These two flies that are doing a good job of looking like bumblebees to discourage predators. So about 70% of our native bees, and bumblebees are native, uh, but 70% of our bees are actually ground dwelling. They are, they're able to burrow into the ground and make their uh, nests there. And uh, the sweat bees are tiny, beautiful bees that are attracted to our perspiration because they, they like the minerals found in our perspiration, but they are totally harmless. They don't sting almost, uh, Almost none of our native bees are, are a problem. I, I can't think of any of, I've never been stung by any bee for that matter, except by, uh, but I have been stung by yellow jackets. Um, the polyester bee or cellophane bee makes its own plastic bag. The, the mother of, you know, uses uh, that bag that she extrudes from her own body and on the sides of the, uh, of the cavity there uh, in the ground. And then uh, lay, and then uh, deposits the what's called bee bread, the liquid food, a combination of the pollen and nectar, uh, and the egg is attached to the side there, so it'll drop down and feed on that uh, bee bread. And then when the bee is becomes an adult, it can chew its way out of its plastic bag and emerge into the world. A really remarkable animal here. So to create habitat for ground nesting bees, you might want to have an area devoted 
to this purpose several yards across. You want loose, well-drained soil. You want flat areas or earthen banks. A sunny place, south facing is good. A soil-filled planters would even be helpful uh, and stay off the area so it does so you don't disturb those nests, those tunnels. The megakilidae are cavity nesters and mason bees are among them. Here's the blue orchard mason bee, and it's a real hero of pollination. Uh, they also need mud, just, just like butterflies, but for a different reason. They're partitioning uh, their egg chambers uh, with the mud. They actually bring the mud and, and seal off each separate chamber, chamber in, in one of these tubes. Leafcutter bees are another member of this uh, group that uh, uses tubes, or uh, they might use holes in, in, uh, in wood that other insects have created. And you can see how these, this leafcutter bee is able to uh, cut off a perfect circle uh, that it then uh, of a leaf that it then full, rolls up and uh, it'll stuff that leaf into a hole or into a cavity and in that way it'll line its chamber with a leaf uh, and, and see, it'll also use uh, pieces of leaf to seal off the chamber. And uh, it's kind of comical the way leafcutter bees often raise their abdomen. It's a very distinctive thing about them. Here's some crops pollinated by leafcutter bees, blueberry, onion, carrot, and alfalfa. So it's not just wild plants that they're pollinating. So here are some, uh, some of the species that leafcutter bees can visit, including uh, rose leaves, which uh, can disturb gardeners. But uh, you know, when I see those, those circles cut out of leaves, I'm proud uh, to know that I'm sustaining leafcutter bee pollinations. And uh, it does not harm the, the plant in the slightest to have a few circles cut out of it. So here's uh, an illustration of, uh, uh, in this case, these, these holes were bored to accommodate different kinds of bees, cavity dwelling bees. The leaf cutter bee on top, the rosin bee uses ros to part, a rosin to partition its chambers. You can see the larvae inside there. And then the larvae of the mason bee with the mud as, as the partitioning. So to accommodate these different kinds of uh, cavity nesting bees, uh, the, the use different sized uh, tubes with, of different sized holes. Uh, and here are some kinds of plants that, are, that will serve that purpose, lovage and allium, that the invasive Japanese knotweed, elderberry and blackberry stems and hydrangea. Uh, and here is another uh, approach that some people sometimes take, the bee hotel here uh, with holes drilled in it. However, uh, there, there are some things to think about. Uh, you can buy those tubes, for example, but they're all a uniform size, so they won't, won't accommodate a variety of bees as, as will um, natural uh, uh, stems. And for the same reason, uh, these plastic straws are not a good idea. But even um, bamboo canes, which you can find in uh, different sizes, uh, the problem that both of these materials have is that they're non-porous and that's not good for the bees either. And I likewise, I don't uh, really recommend that you use, that you drill in wood and, and expect that to be your means of, of inviting um, populations of uh, cavity nesting bees because it's, uh, it's impossible to monitor them. It's impossible to uh, uh, what, what a lot of people like to do is actually uh, align the, their tubes uh, or their stock, the uh, lengths of stock with uh, rolled up pieces of paper, and then they will save the larvae, um, put them in their refrigerator, and then put them in an, uh, a release box in the spring and let them go when it's nice and warm. Uh, and that way they can uh, destroy any uh, insect uh, or any uh, pest um, pests that might visit some of these cavities in uh, the stalks or any, any diseased, um, any presence of disease, that, that, that can all be monitored. Uh, so native bee magnets uh, are uh, featured here. These are uh, plants that attract so many different kinds of pollinators, uh, or especially in particular native bees. So wild bergamot is, comes in at number one, it attracts the 15 different native bee genera. One of my favorite plants. Black-eyed Susan coming in in second place at 14. 
bone set at 13. There are six different plants that attract 12 different native bee genera, swamp, milkweed, butterfly weed, tick seed, oxeye sunflower, mountain mint, and blue vervain. I'd like to feature mountain mint for a minute because it, uh, the, the uh, impressive diversity of insects that visit it is just delightful. There's a great black wasp on the right, a tachinid fly upper left, and a bumblebee lower left. Uh, one uh, delightful thing about this plant is if you take some of those leaves and rub them on your skin, it's a natural uh, mosquito repellent. Lasts for at least 15 minutes. Does a great job. You could even make yourself a cup of mountain mint tea. So it, it's an irresistible plant for so many different pollinators. So coming in uh, with 11 native bee genera, foxglove beard tongue and golden alexanders are both spring blooming plants and the cup plant that we saw earlier and New England aster. Wild geranium is another important spring blooming plant and big leaf aster is in the fall and yellow coneflower is also one that attracts 10 different genera. At nine, we have anisysa, purple coneflower, Jacob's ladder, Ohio spiderwort, ironweed and culver's root. Harebell attracts eight genera and wild lupin and bloodroot seven. Now we mentioned that uh, in addition to pollinators, there are predators and parasites. Uh, here, uh, and also that spiders eat everything possible and so do praying mantises. Uh, but lace wings are much more valuable in my opinion because they are uh, focusing on those pest insects like mealybugs, spider mites, thrips, aphids, and caterpillars. And you can attract the adult, uh, adult lace wings with these plants here, including you notice dandelion. You can make a lace wing hotel by upending this uh, rolled up piece of cardboard inside a, a, a plastic bottle with the bottom cut off. And lacing will, will fly up underneath that and work its way in. There are many kinds of ladybugs out there and they're all good at eating, uh, the, the larvae that is, are good at eating aphids, mites, and mealybugs. And there's a list of host plants, or not, not host plants, excuse me, plants that uh, are, uh, have flowers that will attract uh, ladybug beetles. And you can make a ladybug hotel using nothing but pine cones in a mesh bag. Fireflies are also beneficial predators. They consume insect larvae, snails, and slugs, give them low hanging trees, forest litter, long grasses, ponds, and streams. Don't use fertilizers or pesticides on your property. And please turn off your outdoor lights because that confuses and disorients them. Assassin bugs consume impressive quantities of caterpillars, beetles, mosquitoes, and flies. And here are nine different plants that they can pollinate. And even though they may, they may not be great pollinators, they'll help themselves to the uh, nectar there and that will give them the energy they need to keep on doing the job they're doing. Uh, Hoverflies are also called surfid flies and they consume impressive quantities of aphids. And there are many plants here that will attract the uh, adult when, uh, when the adults when they are foraging on flowers. I see several of these photos are of surfid flies on dandelion. These tiny Turkogramma wasps. Uh, there's a, a list of plants on the left that attract them. An, an impressive list of pests that braconid wasps consume. And here are eight plants that those wasps will find to get energy from. I'd like to uh, recommend that, that uh, when we're thinking about how to support pollinators, we think about trees and shrubs first. Every tree and shrub has a large quantity of flowers, uh, especially as it grows bigger, uh, more flowers every year. Uh, what's not to like for a pollinator? So for example, willows could be the most important plant uh, to add to your landscape uh, because of the importance of early blooming um, 
uh, floral resources, both nectar and pollen. So speaking of early blooming, you can have a, a Chinese witch hazel open its flowers in January and uh, honeybees can come and check it out and, and be buzzing around, uh, having a great time. Common witch hazel at the bottom does the reverse, it flowers in the fall. Redbud, fantastic pollinator tree, blooms in the spring. What a beautiful specimen. And any fruit tree is a, is a source of nectar and pollen for these native bees and for all pollinators. So is American plum, so is beech plum, black cherry and choke cherry, as we saw with birds. Floral resources are there too. Virginia rose and Carolina rose. Juneberry again. Maples and oaks, even though they don't have shower, uh, fl showy flowers, uh, they, they can uh, get pollen from those and nectar from the, uh, in, in the case of the maple. Basswood is a great tree for pollinators. Blueberry flowers for bumblebees, especially. Here's the red osier dogwood. Common nine bark, it's a magnet for pollinators. Winterberry holly is useful. Staghorn sumac again. Look at, look at the number of honeybees on that uh, inflorescence there. And again, the viburnums. And any native hydrangea. And mountain laurel, which is a beautiful shade tolerant shrub. Think about spring ephemerals that are able to uh, poke up uh, their, their blossoms in the spring uh, when nothing else is available for those hungry insects. Spring beauty, the minor bee, uh, spring beauty minor bee is the only insect that will visit the spring beauty flower. And like, likewise, the trout lily bee and has a special relationship with the trout lily. Snowdrops, crocuses, grape hyacinth, Siberian squill, and bees do love that blue color. Wild bleeding heart, these, this is a plant that will bloom a second time into the fall or perhaps even bloom all through the year. Bloodroot, trillions. Here's a yellow trillion that smells like lemon. Winter aconite, wild daffodil. The Lenten rose or Christmas rose, and amazing how it can bloom in the middle of winter. And now let's think about annuals for pollinators, which includes sunflower, Mexican sunflower, zinnia, spider flower. Think about culinary herbs for pollinators, basil, chives, rosemary, oregano, lavender, catnip. I'm featuring here a, a flowering calendar for native pollinator plants offered by Kathy Neal, PhD. She's retired now. Uh, and that same uh, uh, reference that I gave you earlier for wildflowers, extension.unh.edu. You can find this uh, and download this list, which is quite useful because it shows when the plant is blooming and it also shows what the color of the bloom is. And you can rely on Kathy's expertise in terms of what she considers to be the most valuable pollinator plants. This is a wonderful list uh, that you can use as a start when you're creating your pollinator garden. Now to acquire all these wonderful plants, you might want to grow seed, grow them from seed because it's the, the most, uh, most inexpensive way to get a quantity of plants. And uh, some seeds have special germination requirements. So any of these uh, links at the bottom of the page will help you out there. Uh, cold treatment is the process where uh, uh, some, some seeds require an extended period of time uh, where they've experienced cold and wet conditions. So it has to be the, uh, the, the only, um, uh, the range of temperature necessary here is from 34 degrees to 41 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's a fairly narrow range uh, that overcomes the, um, the dormancy requirements. And um, so you can uh, put them in plastic bags and store them in your refrigerator or uh, 
and I have a number of bags in my refrigerator right now, but I also started a number of seeds just by putting them in flower pots um, and, and large pots that had soil, uh, were, were, were filled with potting soil. And I covered them with a very thin layer um, uh, of, of sand uh, and then left them out there. And they, they're going to experience winter because they're out in the winter and that will um, uh, overcome their dormancy, which, which, you know, if they were just sitting in a bag inside and uh, in the room temperature, you wouldn't be able to get them to germinate in the spring because they wouldn't have had that uh, cold treatment. Uh, and it's good to plant them fairly densely. Uh, they, in fact, they seem to like it uh, when there's a lot of company, at least at first. And, uh, and then when it's time, uh, put them into these trays so they can create what's called a plug. Uh, and while they're not, uh, there's not a lot of soil in there, but it's enough to get that plant off to a good start. Uh, there was a, uh, I live in Amherst and in Northampton, uh, there was a pollinator garden created in a public place on a slope, a steep slope where a, a group of volunteers stripped the, the slope of sod and then planted these plugs. And this was done in November. And the next spring, those plants just took off. So it, it's pretty remarkable how well plugs can do if you give them a chance. And the advantage of, of uh, growing plants from seed, by the way, is that you can be guaranteed that every seed is a unique individual. Uh, so you get the genetic diversity and, and a, as well as the quantity and economy. Uh, but vegetation propagation also has its uses. If you want to, if you have one plant and you want it to, be, to become five, four or five or more, uh, it might be possible just to uh, using clippers to, to separate the root systems of each of those stalks and then replant them. Layering is another way to get uh, more individuals from a particular plant. Uh, if you bury it with, uh, with uh, if you bend it over and, and, and keep it uh, moist and in contact with the soil, it will root and then you can cut, it, cut off that uh, point of attachment and it, it's an independent plant now. Cuttings are another way. There, it's remarkable how many plants you can just cut the, the stem and uh, then cut off the, the lower leaves. And then that stem, uh, uh, you put it in a pot, keep it watered, um, and it'll grow, grow roots and create another plant. Here's a list of nurseries uh, in Massachusetts and also sources of native plant seeds. And, I, and again, I can send you this list if you send me an email message. Uh, and think of these companies not just as resources for the plants and seeds, but as resources for information. Uh, in most cases, they're happy to help and, and uh, tell you what they can about uh, whatever question you might have. Uh, if you're wondering what plants will work, if you have you know, a shady spot or a wet spot, or uh, you know, they'll, they'll be able to guide you with things like that. I also uh, recommend the, this, uh, the master gardeners who, um, who can help you uh, either by phone or via email if you have a question about either an, an ID uh, question, if you want to know what you've got, or if you want, have a plant that's not doing well, you can send them a photo and they might be able to diagnose the problem and, and suggest uh, how you can uh, get that plant to be healthy. Think about joining a garden club. You can learn a lot from other gardeners and, and share with them as well, or just befriend gardeners in your neighborhood. And for that matter, think about uh, proposing work days so you can help each other out, uh, creating all this wonderful uh, nature habitat. And invite children to be part of it because they can have that experience of pride and just enjoy the uh, excitement of, of uh, discovery that nature always offers. Uh, love and respect for nature is very important for all of us now as we enter this next peri period of time, which is so critical uh, to be responsible for uh, establishing and, and uh, ensuring that our environment continues to be livable. All decisions must maximize the welfare of the unborn unto the seventh generation, according to great binding, great binding law of the 
Iroquois Confederation. There is no limit to what we can do together. Start where you are. Thank you for doing your part. And uh, again, here's my uh, email address, info at johnroot.net. So uh, thank you. You're, you're welcome. Beautiful photographs. Thank you very much. I steal well. <laughs> They're not mine. <laughs> I get them from the internet. You put on a very good program. Thank you. Yes. Very inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. I, I love to hear that word inspiring because that's certainly my aim. I, <laughs> I want to inform and inspire. I hope that we can, you know, just, just change, uh, change what's happening out there. Thank you to Jim Allen for telling us about this last Monday. Have you any experience with bottle brush buckeye growing in local uh, backyards? I have not. I hear that. I understand it's uh, a tree that's going to attract uh, hummingbirds. But you're wondering if it's uh, if if this is a good place for it, or yeah, I'm wondering if this is a, a good spot here in in my yard in Northampton. Okay, so uh, I mentioned Missouri Botanical Garden as a good resource. Uh, if you do a search for the plant that you're talking about that you're wondering about, and uh, go to Missouri Bot Botanical Garden, uh, indicate that plant, and it'll pop up. And it'll it'll give you the uh, the growing requirements of that plant. Wonderful, thanks. You're welcome. Well, if there are no other questions, thank you for joining me and uh, and enjoy being out there. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>